what are the keys to the class? I've designed this class because I was an undergraduate vaguely recently, uh, kind of, uh, like in the 90s. And I know, that's not that recent. So, uh, and when I was an undergraduate, what used to drive me crazy was classes with lots of gray areas where I wasn't sure what exactly I was required to do, and I didn't know how to, say, ace the class, you know? And in my opinion, ideally a college class would be uh, so straightforward in terms of what you're expected to do and uh, how to do well in the class that you could, if you worked hard and were reasonably smart, which all of you are, we could, you could ace the class. So I've tried to construct a class that way, with a totally open agenda in terms of how it's graded uh, and so on. So what does that mean? That means uh, for the essays, we go into a lot of depth talking about how you do well on these essays. Uh, for the exams, we have very thorough review sessions and review sheets so you know exactly the material that you're responsible for. And then you can, if you work hard enough, ace those exams. And I, and I want you to. That would be terrific. I would love that. Uh, so rule one for the class is show up. So I know that sounds really simple, and, and I'm webcasting it, so it sounds contradictory, but I want you to show up. And, that's, and this class is constructed so that if you do show up, you're going to do pretty well. Uh, because it's pretty simple how to do well in the class. It just requires a little bit of effort and showing up. And if you've ever noticed this, college classes disproportionately reward showing up, right? Like if you show up, do pretty badly on a few things, you can still pass a class, right? Like if you show up and you bomb an exam, you probably still get like a 50 or a 60. But if you don't show up for the exam, you fail the exam, you get a zero, right? And if you've ever had a zero in a class, you know it's almost impossible to pull out a good grade after that. But you can show up and screw up an exam and still pull out like a B plus or an A minus. I mean, that's, that's what I've been told. I've never done anything like that in my life. <laughs> so, and why do we construct classes this way? Why do, why do college professors reward just showing up so much? Why do we give you 70 points just to get a D instead of a zero? Why do we do that? The reason is because we believe that the world works that way, that the world rewards showing up. And those of you who have experienced the real world, most, most all of you have experienced the real world. Anyway, those of you, think back to when you were in reality. Uh, as you know, you're not there now. Uh, but as you know, if you don't show up for your job, you get friggin' fired, right? Um, and that's true. The biggest rule in life is show up. You'll do at least reasonably well if you do show up, and that's why we structure classes to really over-reward showing up. Um, okay, second thing you need to do, pay attention. Uh, the lecture, I know, these are really simple, annoyingly simple things. Okay, uh, you need to pay attention because a huge amount of the material for the course is in these lectures. So uh, it's very important that you show up and pay attention. Please do not talk in the lectures. I, I get ludicrously angry, uh, blow my top, it's ridiculous. You don't want to see it. It's very, very, very ugly. Um, and I hope I can just say that and not have to try to do it, because uh, I don't know if I'll live up to that. But uh, please just pay attention, don't talk. I'm going to have a laptops okay policy provisionally, uh, but I will move to a no laptop policy if no one's friggin' paying any attention at all. Okay. Uh, the third thing you have to do, do the readings. <laughs> I'm straight, I had to look at my notes. What do you do? Do the readings, yes. Uh, so. Do the readings. Uh, the readings are selected to be really, really good. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. So there's no reason you shouldn't be doing the readings. And you should know that this week, the readings have already started. So there's a reading uh, that you're responsible for this week. Uh, and then the fourth thing is study for the exams. And as I've said, we make that very simple. We tell you exactly uh, what you're expected to do. Uh, and that way, you can ace the exams, because that's what we really would like you to do. There's no reason you can't kick total ass in this class. And we would like that. Uh, in no way am I at war with you trying to get your grade down or curve you down or anything. I'm actually working with you to try and get you a uh, kick-ass grade in this class. Um, so as an extension of the showing up policy, uh, makeup assignments will always be more difficult than the actual assignment that you would miss. So just turn it in to begin with and show up at the exams. If you don't show up at the exams, horrible, terrible, terrible, awful things will befall you. Uh, just don't do it. So if you do all this stuff, if you show up, pay attention, do the readings, and study for the exams, which is a pretty simple list, you will do well in the class, and you might get a really good grade in the class, and we would like that. OK. Um, another thing that's required for the class is an experimental participation, uh, so that you can get an on-the-ground look at what social psychology research is like, the nuts and bolts, the concrete experience. We require you to participate in one experiment over the course of the semester. I'll give you more information on that in like a couple weeks. Um, also, we may offer a second one for extra credit. Just depends on whether there's enough slots uh, to accommodate this many people. 
because there are a lot of people here. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, there's a lot of people here. This is freaking me out. <laughs> okay. So overall, you'll be graded on the exams, most of all, like 20% for each exam, and then like a 40% catch-all category for the essays, uh, both the short ones and the longer ones, and then also uh, the quizzes. Uh, so the readings, to talk a little bit about the readings, they're very eclectic. They're really diverse. Uh, there's two sets of readings. So one is uh, these books, right, these three books, which I've picked because I find them really, really interesting. Uh, they're basically, in my opinion, the three greatest books in the history of social psychology. So when I went to go figure out what books to give you and make you read, these were the ones that came immediately to mind. Uh, I'll be very interested to hear on like the end evaluations which ones you like the best. I think most people end up saying they like the Cialdini book the best. I like the Haidt book the best, Jonathan Haidt's book. Um, other people say the Wilson book, whatever. Um, so the books are really interesting. The articles, what's up with these articles? These are real professional articles. All the uh, articles that are in the required readings folder, in the resources folder, on the vSpace webpage, they're all real professional articles. And here again, I've given you real professional articles full of confusing statistics, and I understand that, and I want you to read through the confusing statistics and get as much out of these articles as you possibly can. And why, why have I given you professional articles instead of just secondary pieces like books and review pieces and stuff? I've given you those because I want you to have some insight on what professors read and graduate students so that you can really size up what professors are doing when they do social psychology and also maybe size up how into this you are. You know, because for advanced study in this area or in any area in the social sciences, you'll need to be reading these kinds of articles. And you maybe already are, and this is very pedantic to you, but uh, if you're not, then this is an entree to academia in a way. This is the real stuff that we read, that we write, and I want you to have the experience of having to kind of muddle through them. Uh, now people, more than any other aspect of the class, uh, end up skimping on this, and their grades suffer. Uh, I, at the end of the semester, we'll always have people lined up saying, I should have gotten an A, but I got an A minus, I should have gotten an A plus, uh, but I got an A, I should have gotten a D, but I got an F, whatever. And when I talk to them, I, it's overwhelmingly clear that they're not reading the articles. So uh, if there was one key to like not screw up this class, it would be don't skimp on the articles like everybody else freaking does. Um, there's quizzes that enforce that you've read them. So we have quizzes, and you'll do well on the quizzes. You'll do very well on the quizzes if you just read the articles. You'll, uh, and there's also multiple choice questions on the exam about the articles. You'll ace all those if you read them. You'll miss all of them if you don't. Um, they're constructed to basically just be like, are, have you read these things? And that's what I want. Okay, um, let's see here, what else? Oh yeah, I should introduce uh, Nora Broge is our head reader. This is a new position that's been created in the sociology department for classes of this sort because readers just aren't enough. Readers are fantastic. We have an incredible fleet of readers. Many of them have read for this class before. Uh, we have advanced psychology and sociology students. Great readers, there's not gonna be any problem with that. Uh, but then w I need help because I, y you guys tend to email people a lot. Um, it's part of your generation. I, I respect that. I, I email people a, t a ton. But uh, we need, I need help responding to all this. And Nora is that kind of first line of defense. Uh, Nora is also um, somebody I requested for this position. She's incredibly organized. She hasn't made uh, a mistake in four and a half years, uh, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. Uh, not one. And those of you who've had her as a GSI before will, I'm sure, agree with that. Uh, so yeah, so anyway, Nora, do you wanna? All right, that's Nora, so Nora's here. <laughs> Infallible, um, if you want to ask questions about the class, they should generally be directed at Nora, then you will get the correct information. If you want wrong information, email me. Uh, and that's, yeah, and that's how it is, because I've made so many mistakes in the last four and a half years. Uh, yeah, so when should you email me? If you have like a medical emergency or something you're not comfortable talking to anybody else about, you can talk to me. Uh, but in general, for sort of day-to-day -day administrative stuff, nor is who you wanna, wanna contact. Okay, um, all right, that's it. Any questions about the organizational stuff? Not about adding the class, I'm about to talk about that. Any questions about organizational stuff? Yes. Uh, I can't say for sure. I guess I would say a mix would be my first thought on that. Good question. Other questions? Okay, cool. So let's talk about adding the class. Uh, so I would love all of you to be able to take the class, but uh, fire code dictates that we must have a certain number of people for a certain number of seats. And so we have to do some kind of priority system for letting people in. 
Um, but I, I, I sincerely would like all of you to take the class, if not this semester, uh, then one in the future. So first, if you want to be in the class, this is like really obvious, uh, you know, register for the class or get on the wait list. That's pretty obvious. Uh, second, uh, I'll be taking attendance through the first uh, week of class and probably the second week as well. It kind of depends on how the wait list sifts out. It may be unnecessary. Maybe people will drop or get added to the class and we won't need to keep doing it in the second week. But for the first, uh, for today and Thursday, we're going to take thorough attendance. If you miss both of these classes, you're not here to hear me saying this. Uh, but uh, for those of you who aren't here, uh, if you miss both the classes this week, you'll be dropped from the class and the wait list uh, or the wait list, uh, and you'll be replaced with people who went to both classes. Then within that, there's a system of priorities. Uh, this is not my system of priorities. I, I don't necessarily endorse it. It is the sociology department. Uh, we will add social majors first. Uh, wait, yes, social majors first, sociology majors first, seniors, and because seniors are, are better people than the rest of us, uh, <laughs> me included. I was a better person when I was a senior. I, I, I wish for those days. Uh, and then juniors, and then I assume sophomores who are not as good of people as juniors and seniors or whatever. Yeah, this is not my system. Uh, this, is, this is the sociology department system. Uh, so that's how it's going to work. So again, if you want to get into the class, just show up. Um, and you have to show up in order to get into the class. We'll probably carry over the attendance thing to next week. Yes, Nora's telling me. Nora will in general know the answers to these questions, and I won't. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I respect that. Um, okay. So uh, are there any questions about, about this? Uh, oh, sorry. So there's an attendance sheet or a series of attendance sheets that are going around now. It is your responsibility to get on one of these attendance sheets. You need not get on all of them. Wait, we're not even, no, sorry, I lied about that. Nora is now distributing attendance sheets. Uh, it's your responsibility to get on one of these. You don't need to get on all of them, just get on one. Um. Yes, at the bottom. Please write your name in at the bottom so we can keep track of your attendance and talk to me after the class. Other questions about this? It's pretty simple, I think. I think. Okay. All right. So, and it should work well because it's not in my hands. Okay. Now we'll talk a little bit about the substance of the class, then we'll take a break, and then we'll do a lecture. We'll do this lecture. Um, so, the substance of the class. I love the area of social psychology. When I was, uh, well, you're not all, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, but when I was uh, in your position, when I was an undergraduate student, uh, I was aimless and wandering through the academic desert. I, I had no solace. I was, uh, I was adrift. Uh, I can't come up with anything else, but I was like that. And, and I didn't, I was trying to find something I was really passionate about, something I could get really into. And then I registered for a, a social psychology lecture class that I've tried to basically pattern this class after. Uh, and it was taught by a graduate student, my friend uh, Will Kaltoff, who now teaches at Kent State University. He's a really great guy. And I took this class and I started to get exposed to sociology and psychology takes on human behavior and explaining our position in the world and our influence on the world and the world's influence on us. And, and it all just sort of clicked. Like for me, I was like, all right, I found it. I found the material that I find really fascinating that I'm really passionate about. And so for me, this class is an effort to then render that to you, uh, to give you the experience that I had. And if I can do any small part of what Will did for me, then you'll, you'll enjoy the class and I think, I think you'll dig the material. So what is social psychology? It's essentially the study of psychological and social influences on behavior. You don't need to write that down. You don't need to write that down? Yeah. Um, by the way, I forgot to say, this whole, this whole first lecture, uh, you can just pay attention. There's no need to take notes. None of this will be on the exam. Okay. So, Basically, the best research in the social sciences on the causes and effects of human behavior in everyday life, I think, happens in social psychology. And I don't think most people would debate that. Uh, social psychology, in social psychology, we try to learn why and how it is that someone would come into a lab environment and try to shock somebody to death or torture prisoners or conform to absurd stimuli. We also try to study interesting questions like, what are the non-conscious influences on your behavior? Is subliminal advertising real? What makes people cooperate? What makes people discriminate? Uh, what makes people get over emotionally traumatizing experiences? What makes people happy? What makes people fall in love? And so on. And 
in this class, that's essentially what this class is about, is all those things. All those everyday things that you would sit around, or, well, if you're anything like me, you would sit around and talk with your friends about anyway. But here, we'll try to study them in a systematic, uh, formally guided, scientifically oriented way, and hopefully get some kind of greater insights than we would if we were just trying to figure things out on our own. Um, we're going to take uh, what we've learned from 100 years of social psychological research, and if all goes well, by the end, you'll know more about yourself and your position in the world than you did when you walked in here. Um, okay, so now I just read some social psychology research that says that you cannot maintain attention for more than like 40 minutes at a time. So since I'm about to give you about a 40 minute lecture, let's take like a two minute break, talk amongst yourselves, read whatever you want, and we'll be back in two minutes. Okay, okay, if I get your attention, we'll get started again. Okay, all right, so now we're all rested, we're ready, we're tan, we're, you know, we look, we look good, you know, and we're, we're ready to go. All right, so uh, a couple notes uh, Nora told me to tell you. Um, she doesn't like to speak directly. I'm just going to tell you that Nora said, uh, uh, wait to buy, I'm sorry, wait to buy the books uh, if you're on the wait list because they might not let you return them. Is that anywhere? They are good books. I think you'd like them. If you don't take the class this semester because of whatever circumstances, I would love for you to take it the next year when I teach it again. Uh, the second thing, special accommodation letters, like if you're on a sports team or something like that. If, you're, if you have a DSP thing, I know about that. You don't need to drop that off. But if you have a special accommodation associated with some sort of sports team, you're an athlete, you're, you're strong, you're mighty, please give us that. We're very impressed. Please give us that. Uh, and Nora, Nora will then know it. Okay. Um, okay, so today's lecture, Normally, I'm morally and philosophically opposed to doing an actual substantive lecture on the first day of class. Uh, we're tired. I don't know about you, but I was, I, I was actually like on the beach a week ago. It was beautiful, like sand beneath my toes. And then that vacation slipped away like so much sand through my fingers. And I'm not ready to be back. I don't know about you. It's difficult. It's a struggle, right? It's, it's not easy. Yeah. But here we are, and we got to make the best of it. Um, and this class will meet two days a week uh, this semester. Uh, I've taught it in the past for three days a week, so normally I could just give you the day off the first day. I really apologize, but I can't do that because we just don't have enough time. So we're going to do a substantive lecture. But this substantive lecture is really just to orient you to the field of social psychology, get some kind of basic ground rules about how the field works. Uh, you're not really expected to take notes. Um, you don't even have to pay attention. You know, you can do whatever you want. Okay? Um, no, please pay attention.
Okay, but you're not responsible for all this. Just listen, just focus on listening. And then on Thursday, we'll start with uh, material that you'll be responsible for for the exam. Okay, so what is this class about? It is about social psychology. Uh, what is social psychology? Or as those of us in the know call it, social psych. It is the study of human behavior and attitudes and how they are affected by and themselves affect groups. And what we do in this area is do research that's guided by the belief that an understanding of society is enriched by understanding the role of the individual in reference to society. Okay, so a lot of sociologists don't bother with individuals. They don't, they don't need to butts with individuals. They look at the group level or the nation level or something like that, and those of you who take sociology classes might be used to that, and that's cool. I have no gripe with that. But in social psychology, we have this assumption that you're gonna understand the world better if you take into account the individual. And this makes it, in some ways, a compelling field of study for us to learn, right? Because we are ourselves individuals out in the world. And understanding our position in the world is something we're kind of struggling to do all the time anyway. I'm trying to get these lights right. Okay. So one of the fundamental questions that we're interested in in social psychology is why does society even happen in the first place? Why society? Why is it instead that we're not trapped in the state of nature that Thomas Hobbes famously described as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And if you look at this picture of Thomas Hobbes, I think you can understand why he saw it so negatively. Um, by the way, I love that he calls it nasty, brutish, and short, as though you'd want some like longer life in this horrible state of nature. Um, it reminds me of that joke, about, that Woody Allen joke about the two women in the restaurant. One of them's like, oh, the, you know, the food here is so awful. And the other one's like, I know, and the portions are so small. So. So why is, it, why is it that that doesn't happen? Why is it that that state of nature that Enlightenment philosophers like Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes were so obsessed with, how, why is it that that doesn't obtain? Why is it we have society? And my hope is that by the end of this semester, we'll have some understanding of why it is that humans are fundamentally social animals and how it is that we interact with one another. Okay, so here is a very crude look at levels of analysis in social science research. And uh, you have to promise me as we go through this that you won't show this to any of your other professors or anything like this because this is like woefully unscientific, but it's just an effort to sort of orient you to where we are, okay? Uh, and you can see these like levels of analysis move from up here, societies, nations, cultures, down to like groups, the sort of meso level as we refer to it, then the individual level, and then the kind of sub-individual level, and then the like molecular sub-sub-individual type level here. And a lot of sociologists hang out up here, right, in the discourse between how societies, nations, and cultures are shaped by groups, organizations, families, and social networks. And that's great. I like that. Sometimes I do that kind of research, too. It's really cool. Uh, here, we're going to be primarily in this range. Or, well, okay, let's say this. Sociological social psychology. There's, okay, social psychology is an area that's in two disciplines, sociology and psychology. And that's going to be kind of confusing, and we'll have to very cumbersomely refer all the friggin' time to like sociological social psychology or psychological social psychology. By the end of the semester, you'll be so tired of hearing me say that. I apologize in advance. Okay, sociological social psychology is at kind of this level. How does the individual, his or her behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs shape the outcomes of groups and organizations and networks, and then vice versa? How do the groups shape the individual? Uh, in psychological social psychology, in, as you would probably guess, they're a little bit more interested in a somewhat lower level of analysis. Uh, they're a little bit more interested in cognition. Because why? Because you would go into psychology if you're really interested in the human mind, right? Uh, and that's great. So they tend to hang out in this area, uh, individual behavior, attitudes, and beliefs, and how they're shaped by the mind, cognitions, and perceptions. They do occasionally scale up to this level as well, but they mostly are hanging around in here. So in this class, we'll be covering this stuff as well as this stuff and hopefully try and give you an understanding of how groups, organizations, and networks arise from the mind, the properties of the mind, cognitions, and perception of the world. Okay. Uh, more recently, really reductionist, uh, reductionism is a word for like when scientists try to go down in levels of analysis. So really reductionist sociologists like myself are interested in the individual and stuff. Less reductionist ones hang around up here. Really reductionist psychologists go all the way down to here, to how neurons, uh, genes, and, and even hormones influence behavior and outcomes in groups and stuff. Uh, so that's a very sort of ham-fisted, awkward sky view of the social sciences uh, that, again, you've promised not to show your other social science professors. Okay. 
So within social psychology, here's another way to look at levels of analysis. Uh, person to person, we, we do a lot of research of this sort where individuals are interacting with other individuals and how does that work? Stuff like cooperation, altruism, gift giving. Uh, we also look at group to person influences. How does the group shape your behavior and attitudes? So like conformity or obedience dynamics. Uh, and then we also look at person to group. How are groups made up of individual actors who come together and influence group outcomes? Uh, and then we also do group to group stuff that we won't talk about as much in here. We w no, we will talk about that during the social identity theory part of the class. Um, and then the big secret in social psychology is we actually do a lot of this too. Just talking about the individual, uh, their attitudes, their behavior. We're not really supposed to do that because it's social psychology, but we do it anyway because they let us do it and it's really fun. Uh, so we're going to talk about all these levels of analysis in this class. Okay. So what sort of subjects of analysis do social psychologists get interested in and do research on? Well, it's pretty much the topics from the class, right? Uh, stuff like roles, identity, power, status, influence, sexuality. We won't have that much in the, on that in this class. Don't get too excited. Uh, emotions, conformity. I know, I know, I'm upset too. Obedience, self-esteem, happiness, stereotypes, social exchange, political views. I cut that actually um, because people didn't like it, not because I don't think it's important. Uh, altruism, automaticity, religious beliefs, aggression, and so on. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about all this stuff uh, throughout the course of the semester. Uh, this picture has nothing to do with anything. This is just a cute little picture. I don't know. Um, that's like life as a nonconformist in Berkeley, I guess. Nonconformity gets very complicated here. Okay. Um, okay, so up close a little bit more with sociological and psychological social psychology, because you're going to need to understand this distinction uh, by the end of the semester. So sociological social psychology. What are some distinguishing features of sociological social psychology? Okay, well one, there's this heavy use of theory, okay? Sociological social psychologists are obsessed with building general theories about the human condition. This is sometimes referred to as physics envy, where we try to abstract laws that apply to people uh, across a variety of circumstances. Now, I'm actually vaguely sympathetic to this approach, though I'm also, I acknowledge its weaknesses, but it, it is a cool idea to try to make these big overarching theories of society, and we'll have some of those in this class. And you can judge for yourself if that approach really works. Uh, sociological social psychologists primarily use experiments as their empirical methodology when they go do their empirical research, but they don't just use experiments. They also do surveys, interviews, ethnographies, and so on. Uh, they're focused on some of the bigger topics, right? Because they're interested in the relationship between the group and the individual level. So they do research on power, status, identity, roles, organizational behavior, social exchange, a little bit bigger level of analysis. And one criticism, or maybe you would consider this good, uh, is that it's an area that's referred to often as very scientistic. Has anybody heard this word before, scientistic? So scientific is when you sort of imitate the style of science. And sometimes they get a little bit obsessed with acting really scientific and stuff rather than just being scientific and using the scientific method. In this class, we will be addressing the area of social psychology as a science. So we will be using the scientific method or seeing how well the practitioners have used the scientific method to make the case for their point. We'll be doing that all the time. That will be sort of assumed in this class, uh, that social psychology is trying to be a science and we'll learn it as such. Uh, but like I'm saying, sociological social psychologists, they sometimes go a little overboard, and I'm, I'm sure I'm guilty of that as well. Psychological social psychology is different. It has its own strengths and shortcomings and features and foibles and whatnot. Uh, psychological social psychology has very little theory, or the theories tend to be effects or biases or tendencies, like some sort of A to B relationship, not these larger interlocking complicated theories uh, they are trying to describe a lot at once. Uh, they're smaller. Uh, like effects and tendencies. Psychological social psychology, as you might guess, almost exclusively uses uh, experiments. Uh, it's also higher media profile. They write these popular books that are really well received. Uh, they also get their research like in the New York Times and stuff like that because they think they're so cool. And they are pretty cool. Uh, and they're focused on a lot of topics like attribution, self-perception, social cognition, non-conscious influences on behavior, uh, these sort of things that happen in the course of everyday life. I guess I should have finished talking about this. Oh, okay. Other stuff that sociological social psychologists are interested in, because I skipped this, include social structure and personality, mental health, the life course, emotions, 
Ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology is the biggest word that I know. As I don't, and that, no, I cannot define it for you. Um, it's actually a joke that this is like this famously undefined word. You have to go to Howard Garfinkel at UCLA to find out what it means. Um, okay, so feel free to do that. Okay, psychological social psychology, much more uh, tied to perception, attributions, and cognition, a somewhat lower level of analysis. Uh, so it's more individual level research. And it is also very interested in being scientific and using the scientific method, but maybe not so hung up on it. And why is that? Probably because in psychology, everybody's kind of doing science, right? Everybody's doing experiments, testing claims about the way the mind works, the way cognition works, the influence of genes on psychology, whatever. So everybody in psychology is trying to do science. In sociology, whether or not we should be taking a scientific approach is more disputed and contested. So in sociology, they get kind of hung up on, we're doing science and you're not, or whatever. They're really, uh, they're really hung up on it. I'm in this area, so I'm guilty of all these criticisms. Okay, so unlike other areas in sociology, but like most in psychology, social psychology is very into being scientific. What is science? Science is a man pouring crude oil back and forth between graduated cylinders forever. That's <laughs> roughly what science looks like. Um, and that's what the experiment you'll participate in will be like. You'll just be asked to do that over and over. Okay, so what is science? Well, science is most of all people who use the scientific method. It's a social undertaking where a bunch of people get together and use the scientific method to test claims about how the world works and see how true they are and then assess levels of confidence in these claims. So scientific method, here's a definition, a systematic process for evaluating claims about empirical observations and then organizing conclusions into cumulative knowledge. So what are the steps to the sociological method, or sorry, the scientific method? Okay, uh, step one, cut a hole in a box. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> step one. Uh, to, sorry. <laughs> step, step one. Uh, develop some general idea, some claim, some theory about how you think the world works. Uh, then operationalize it by making testable hypotheses. So you might have some big claim, like people have overconfidence in their behavior, and then you'll have some specific operationalized claim, like in this experiment, people will have overconfidence in their behavior in this specific way. Uh, why do you operationalize it? So that you can then test that claim. You test this specific hypothesis using some sort of data that you would have. It doesn't have to be an experiment, though experiments are a very useful methodology. It could be some sort of survey data, or you could go out in the world and directly observe people, or interview them, or what have you. Um, then you derive conclusions, ideally very modest ones, from your findings, and you publish. Or you don't, you know, you don't have to publish, but you'll not get tenure if you don't. Then, you <laughs> don't I know it. Uh, then you return to step one and you do it all over again forever. For, well, for in my case, like 35, 40 years. And, uh, and you learn to love it, hopefully. So you general idea, operationalize, test that specific claim, interpret those data, then come back, or maybe revise your general claim in light of the data and do it again. And that's roughly the scientific method. Um, okay. Another thing that'll be useful, I think, is to have some kind of basic understanding of the philosophy of science. I love the philosophy of science. That's why this is here. I think it's really friggin' interesting. Other people don't always. Okay, so we'll do it in like two slides uh, to spare you the depths of philosophy of science that I could potentially go on and on about. Okay, so uh, the significant figures in the history of philosophy of science. The first two that kind of come up on the scene that sort of establish uh, what science is, what the rules of science are going to be, are Descartes, and Francis Bacon. Does anybody know which one is which? This one is Descartes, okay, and that one's Francis Bacon. It's very easy to remember them because Descartes had really bad hair and Francis Bacon had an awesome hat. Okay. <laughs> so Descartes' big contribution to the philosophy of science was uh, deduction. He said the way we're going to do this, the way we're going to generate new knowledge is by deducing conclusions from what he called, or what people since him have called first principles, okay? So he's gonna, he says, uh, well, what is the line that he's most famous for saying, Descartes? I think therefore I am, excellent. So uh, what he did was he tried to derive some kind of basic principles and prove a whole bunch of things from the things he had high confidence in. So he said, well, I find myself here thinking, therefore I must exist, and that was sort of his first deduction. Then if you read 
uh, discourse on method or whatever it was that, he, that where that appears, I think it's discourse on method, uh, you'll see that his derivations get increasingly wacky and ridiculous after that. Um, they, uh, they just don't really make sense. And in a way, Descartes is a sort of gleaming example of how you can't just deduce everything you would want to know about the world from first principles. But nonetheless, in science, we often do dedu deduction, right? We say A implies B, B implies C, therefore A implies C. And it was important of Descartes to establish the role of uh, propositional logic in science. Uh, the next kind of significant person in philosophy of science is Francis Bacon, the guy with the great hat. He emphasized the role of data and experimentation, especially in, in his philosophy of science. And he said, this deduction stuff is ridiculous. I mean, just look at all the crazy propositions that Descartes came up with. The better way to do it would be induction. We'll look at the data, and then we'll induce some sort of general observations about the world, some sort of general principles about how things work from the data, OK? And in particular, we should do lots of experimentation. So he was the first sort of guy to triumph experimentation, to champion experimentation. Uh, and I actually, I went to uh, England at one point, to London uh, at one point in the fall, and saw the site, the exact site where he did his last experiment. This guy loved experiments so much that he was like on a carriage ride in the snow in London. It's a very beautiful image, I know, you're getting into this. And then he got out, and he wanted to test the claim that like chicken doesn't uh, degrade or whatever or go bad at colder temperatures. So he got a chicken carcass, filled it with snow, and then had another one it didn't and tested this claim that way. But in, the, in doing so, he caught pneumonia and died convalescing in London. Uh, but you can go, I know, it's a very funny story. It's a very funny, <laughs> it's, it's very funny the way Francis Bacon died. Uh, and you yourself can go to London and experience this for yourself. If you're anything like me, you'll be so excited, it'll be ridiculous. Um, Okay, third really significant philosopher of science, David Hume, comes along in the 19th century and points out, shouldn't be to anybody's surprise, science is really imperfect. And we don't really establish things with 100% uh, credibility. It's always possible that our claims will be wrong. Uh, and therefore, our confidence in these principles, these, these ideas that we have, is always probabilistic, okay? The more tests that a claim passes, the better the support for it, the more confidence we have in the finding. But we never reach 100%, right? So we think we had it down with the law of gravity, right? Isaac Newton seemed like he had it all straight, and he did have it straight. He had 99% of the story right, but then Einstein comes along in the early 20th century and says, well, you didn't quite get it all right, and it turned out even the law of gravity was relative. So uh, David Hume says you need to always have probabilistic confidence in your findings, and nowhere is that more true, perhaps, than in social science. Um, OK, cool. And if you take just these philosophers of science and put them together, you have a pretty good synthetic philosophy of science right there. Because in reality, what we do in contemporary science is we use deduction and induction. We don't use the pure form of either. And we use inductive empirical knowledge to test claims that are deduced. And then we have degrees of confidence in those claims. So then, and this stuff, I mean, you really don't get this many places, but I'm obsessed with it. Uh, then in the 20th century, things got really wacky. Uh, here's this guy, Karl Popper, who I really like. He's like a hero of mine. That's really dorky. Um, Karl Popper had this idea of falsifiability, uh, that this was a critical criterion in science, that you have to be making claims that there is some pattern of data where they could be disproven. Um, and if you're making claims where there isn't a, pow uh, a pattern of data uh, that could disprove it, then you're not making real scientific claims. So he would say, that Marx's claim that the only way to understand society is in terms of class struggle, he would say, that's really not a falsifiable claim. That's more like an orienting statement, a sort of philosophical statement. You can't really dispute it. If you did, people would just say, no, no, really, the only way to understand history is, is the history of class struggle. But he would say other claims of Marx's are scientific, like religion's the opium of the masses, that the more religious you are, the less class conscious you'll be. Well, you could go out and test that, right? And there could be some pattern of data you would get when you tested it that would you know, give you less confidence in it. I've, I've done that. I've, done, I've tested that claim. It didn't go very well, and I had less confidence in that claim afterwards. Uh, so that's his idea, this falsifiability criterion. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive. You have to have some claim that could be wrong in order to be really making scientific knowledge. He also has another idea that's a good one, too, which is uh, that theory competition is central to how science works. And it's essentially the boxing champ model of science that theories sort of go to battle with one another, and whichever ones work best for describing reality are the ones that we accept at that time. It's always a probabilistic acceptance, 
but those are the ones that we accept at the time. So, for example, in uh, the 16th and 17th centuries, there were debates about whether, or especially the 16th century, there were debates about whether the, you know, the, the Earth or the Sun was the center of the universe, whether we should have a geocentric or a heliocentric model of the solar system. And why is it that the heliocentric model of the solar system won this boxing match? Well, it described the data better. The geocentric model of the universe just didn't account for the movement of the stars in the sky as well as the heliocentric model did. And so that's why we came to accept it. Other philosophers of science, we won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, Carl Hempel, uh, really cool, he said, scope conditions matter. You need to state when your propositions are true because nothing's true all the time. Water may boil at 100 degrees uh, centigrade at, uh, at, at um, sea level, but it won't on, at the top of a mountain. Nothing is true all the time. You have to have scope conditions that modify and clarify when your claims are true. Uh, Thomas Kuhn, he made the contribution. He was essentially a sociologist, and he was here at Berkeley. And he said that science is a social process, and conformity pressures suppress creativity. So he's kind of coming along like David Hume did and saying science is imperfect. It's not a perfect process. Uh, he said, actually, he had this really good idea that like theoretical uh, programs, theoretical programs and paradigms they don't tend to go away just because the data fails. Their main uh, proponents have to die off, was his claim. And that when they die off, then you can get kind of quick revolutionary change in science. Uh, then Imre Lakatos, great name. Uh, his contribution was that empirical tests are fallible. So you can't just look at the data to make conclusions about theories. Sometimes uh, the data will not support your theory, but it'll be your data that sucks and your theory was good which then we're just down the rabbit hole. We don't know what to do. Um, and then Stephen Toolman, he's really cool. He talked about counterfactual theories. This is, this is starting to go on. OK. <laughs> OK. So what are some more important things about philosophy of science? Often, there is more than one theory or explanation for the observed facts. And the two theories might account equally well for the facts. However, what do we do then? We apply the principle of parsimony, and we go with the theory that's simpler. And going back to the geocentric versus heliocentric models of the universe, uh, which I'm sure you were hoping I would return to that, and I, I'm going to go back to that. That's good. So in this case, they kept modifying the geocentric model of the universe by, uh, as they charted the movement of stars that they would predict as they would move through the heavens, they would add, they would find that it didn't conform very well to the geocentric model. So what did they add to their theories? Does anybody know the word? Epicycles. So they would add epicycles because they would find sometimes stars seem to go back in the sky in a way that doesn't seem to make sense if they're going around the Earth. If everything's going around the Earth, nothing should then move in retrograde motion. It should just go around the Earth, right, in a sort of uh, linear way. And so to account for this, they said, oh, well, things are going around round, but then they have little, little roundness within the roundness, and they're doing these little epicycles. And they did this for hundreds of years. They just modified the theory with epicycles. And as a result, the theory always accounted for all the data. It always described the world perfectly, but it became increasingly unparsimonious, right? It became a huge theory, and before you know it, they were claiming to explain the world with ba basically data point by data point. But then um, Copernicus comes along and says, no, I have one very simple theory. It accounts for all the data. You don't need epicycles. And we went with that one because it was simpler and more parsimonious. And this is the principle of Occam's razor. And Occam said, entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, which is basically that we should explain the world in the fewest terms possible. Some other good quotes about science. Einstein said, the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. This is the same idea, right? This is essentially Occam's razor. That you want to explain the world, describe the world as, uh, in as few terms as possible. And, if we, and that's what a powerful theory is, is a, is a theory with very few terms but great breadth and scope of explanation. Uh, another aspect of, of science as it's practiced is captured, I think, really well by this quote by Richard Feynman. He said that science is the bending over backwards to prove yourself wrong, or he said something like that. And uh, I really, really love Richard Feynman. I've read all of his autobiographies. I encourage you to as well. He's really awesome. Um, what is Feynman talking about here? What he's saying is that a good scientist is intensely self-critical, and a good social psychologist is also intensely self-critical. And I want you, as you read these articles over the course of the semester, to read them with that same skeptical, critical eye. You know, don't, don't leave behind your skepticism just because I'm telling you this is interesting. Not, not that you would. You're all extraordinarily intelligent people. Uh, 
but keep relentlessly criticizing the work because a good social psychologist will do that for you. And you'll notice in a lot of these papers that the social psychologist will say, okay, I've said this and I've given you these data, but you, know, you might still be concerned about this explanation of the data rather than mine. Or you might be concerned about this problem with this experiment. And then they'll do a follow-up study to address that. And that is a very convincing thing, right? Because you know that they're out to attack their own work and criticize it before you even get to it. Um, so science is the bending over backwards to prove yourself wrong. Kind of counterintuitive. Why do you want to prove yourself wrong? Because you want to get it right. So you want to be relentlessly critical of your claims and conclusions. My philosophy of science is a little bit simpler than all that. Thank God, right? Uh, so there's two levels, basically. There's a theoretical level, general ideas about stuff, technical term, stuff. Uh, maybe you'll have scope conditions about when these general claims apply and when they don't. Uh, maybe you'll have several interlocking ideas so that you have a pretty elaborate theory. Maybe you just have one idea. Maybe you just have one very simple idea. Then a level beneath that is the empirical level. At the empirical level, we have data, and we evaluate the idea in one or more specific circumstances to see how well it works. So general claims and then data, and we go back and forth between the two. Clarity is a must. Uh, if you're interested in the role of clarity in science, I encourage you to Google the Sokol Affair. Um, go to Wikipedia. That's, that's where all knowledge lies. Uh, uh, check it out. It's very interesting. I'm not going to go into it here. Uh, also, we have degrees of confidence in claims. Science is not the way some people make it out to be, where scientists are telling you, we know this all the time for sure, and it will never be reversed. That's not real science. Science involves degrees of confidence in scientific claims, also, many empirical methods are useful. You don't just use experiments. You can use other sources of data. Uh, and again, science lies in the interplay between the general and the specific, general claims and the empirical data we use to test them. OK, a brief history of social psychology. We're, uh, we're really making progress now. OK, so we covered like 2,000 years. No, no, we're going back 2,000 years. OK, so people have been doing social psychology for a long time. If social psychology is observations about the human condition in relation to society, how humans give rise to social order, how people are fundamentally social animals and the causes of their behavior, if that's what social psychology is, then people have been doing it forever, right? Uh, early philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, but then also uh, Renaissance era people like Machiavelli and then Montaigne, uh, writers like Shakespeare or Charles Dickens, uh, and more recently, philosophers like Nietzsche have been essentially doing social psychology for centuries. And uh, it only became systematically studied uh, or proclaimed a scientific area at the very end of the 19th century. The first two books that were written about social psychology both came out in 1908. And one was a psych book and one was a sociology book. Okay, uh, but social psychology really kind of starts with Freud's book. I mean, it's kind of the first identifiable work of social psychology, even though I think it's kind of crap. Uh, is Sigmund Freud's Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. And that is the last time I will mention that book because I don't like it. Um, feel free to read it if you want, but I do. Uh, then you get late 19th and early 20th century sociology and psychology that's sort of increasingly doing social psychology without talking about it, without saying that they are. So you have figures like uh, Zimmel, John Watson from Psychology, Max Weber in Sociology. They're basically doing social psychology. They're not calling it that yet because they won't call it that yet until 1908. Uh, and then in 1898, okay, I, I just went back in time 10 years, whatever. Uh, in 1898, you get the very first social psychology experiment, which was on social facilitation. Uh, eh, facilitation. It was conducted at Indiana University in Bloomington uh, by this guy Triplett. Shh, no talking, please. And this is a chart of the findings of the very first social psychology experiment. You are responsible for this on the test. You have to be able to trace that on just freehand. It's not that funny. Okay, so, uh, but I tried. Uh, so this is triplet. Uh, basically what he did was he had people uh, do uh, wind like a reel, like, like they were fishing, although there were no fish. That's kind of boring. Uh, that's one thing you find with social psychology experiments. It's kind of boring for the participants. Uh, so they wound these reels, and then they would either do them in the presence of other people or alone. And he had this idea that he was testing of social facilitation, that when you're in a social setting, you'll wind it faster. It'll facilitate good behavior or whatever. He wasn't very specific about why social facilitation worked. But he was, he was right. As you might guess, he was totally right. And I think I want to say this line is that somebody alone, and this is people together or something. Um, who knows? 
and we don't put your name anymore on the findings, by the way. So that's, that's totally screwed up. Um, we don't do that. So, uh, and this, just, just to show you like how different but also not different social psychology is now, this is a, a, a graph from a conformity study that you'll be reading, I think, next week. Well, you know better than me. You're looking at your syllabus. Uh, and this is uh, some work by Matt Saul Gannick, who's a good friend of mine, a really cool guy. Uh, and he did this online experiment with like tens of thousands of participants, like downloading music under different circumstances. And this is like a graph of how they did it. I don't even understand this, but if we were talking about the paper, I, I promise you I would. Uh, but in any event, it's kind of cool that it's like, on the one hand, really different, right? Like this graph looks way, way more fancy and carefully done. It's generated by a computer. It's got tens of thousands of data points rather than like Michael, Sally, and Jen, you know, uh, winding a fishing reel. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it's not that different, right? It's kind of the same basic thing, and we're still doing the same thing. And accordingly, in this class, you'll be, you'll be seeing findings from across like 100 and some years uh, and we'll still find relevance in work that was done in the 1930s, as well as stuff that's being done now. Or I'll try to get you to see that. Okay, so the history of social psychology concluded, uh, uh, continued. Around 1900, 1908, it branches off into sociology and psychology branches. These two branches communicate with each other some, and then gradually don't, and then they start passing each other in the hallways and like kissing at each other, and uh, like making fun of each other's children, and like low, low shit like that. Uh, in sociology, from like 1900 to 1940, you get the rise of symbolic interactionism, which we'll talk about over the course of the class. Uh, people like Charles Horton Cooley, George Herbert Mead, Herbert Bloomer, who sort of founded our sociology department at Berkeley, uh, and was a professional football player, by the way. Uh, I actually looked up his statistics. He was on a professional football team that scored one touchdown in an entire season, <laughs> like 11 games. But he was really good at sociology. Okay. Uh, which will tell you something about sociology or football, I don't know. But uh, so then from like 1950 to 1990, you get the identity theory debates, which we'll talk about in this class, people debating about whether or not there's a self or, or if there isn't a self, should we understand this situation or personality and so on. From 1960 to 2000, you get the uh, rise of exchange theory, people debating about how best to think of social exchanges between people. 1965 to present, status characteristics theory. Uh, more recently, there's been a greater diversification, but then also theory integration. None of that's meaningful to you. You're just like, what are you talking about? Okay. Uh, the history of psychology, uh, psychological social psychology, also interesting, a little bird's eye view. From 1920 to 1940, Kurt Lewin uh, came to the US, studied at the University of Iowa, talked about field theory. That's some obtuse stuff that we will cover. Uh, in 1937, you get the famous Sharif conformity experiment. Is anybody familiar with the Sharif conformity experiment? Please raise your hand. Okay, good, because we're learning it in this class. So most, for most of you, that'll be new. Uh, in 1951, the Ash Conformity Experiment. In 1957, 1959, through the 60s, people were obsessed with cognitive dissonance theory. They ran a, a variety of really screwed up experiments on poor undergraduates such as yourselves. Uh, in 1958, uh, Fritz Heider invented balance theory. That was awesome for people like me. Uh, in 1961, the Milgram Obedience Experiment started. Have you seen the Milgram Obedience film? Raise your hand, please, if, if you have. <laughs> you will have the option to see it again, of course. Of course. Um, uh, from 1970 to the present, there's been this extreme di diversification and explosion of research. Psychological social psychology is now an enormous area, publishes just a huge number of articles every month. No one person reads all of it anymore. It's impossible. Uh, it's, a, yeah, it's this huge area, and it's very fascinating. Uh, it's also, I should tell you, in terms of numbers of people and numbers of studies and numbers of papers produced, sociological social psychology is far smaller than psychological social psychology. But over the course of the semester, I'm going to try and demonstrate to you that both have something to offer and both are really awesome. Okay, so as we wrap this up, should you take this class? That's the big question, right? Do you want to take this class? At this point, you're probably like, well, the teacher is a big turnoff, but the material seems interesting. That's fair. You're gonna, you're gonna think that for the next four months. Uh, I would compare your decision to take this class, <laughs> I would humbly compare this to your decision to stay in the matrix or not, right? It's no less than that. Um, you should be very suspicious and skeptical at this point. Please don't pack up your books, we're not done yet. Okay, so you have two options, right? You can stay in the world of ignorance and illusion and not know 
social psychology, how did you make it to here, really, not knowing social psychology? It's, I have no idea. Um, so you could take another class. What will happen? Your girlfriend or boyfriend will leave you. <laughs> you will be forced to drop out of school because you'll lose all intrinsic desire for academic achievement. Uh, that's inevitable. Uh, this is based on data. I wouldn't lie to you. Uh, this is the people who have opted out of this class in the past. This is what's happened. You'll become a total failure. And, you know, that's up to you. That's all up to you. Alternatively, you could take the class. Uh, you'll <laughs> become more attractive uh, briefly upon the decision to continue in the class. Like within a month, we'll all be the most beautiful people on campus. Uh, You'll become wealthier as well. I don't know how exactly that will happen, and that's not technically a promise, but I have observed it. Um, you'll learn the meaning of life. You'll attain enlightenment. And in general, your life will be a lot, a lot better. You know, just like what happens in the Matrix when he takes the pill, right? Um, but in all seriousness, the decision to take the class is a little bit like that, right? And I want you to think back to, like, when you decided to go to college. Um, when you decided to go to college, you had some explicit reasons for doing it, right? If you're anything like me, you went to college because you were supposed to go to college. Your parents expected you to go to college, and you could go to college, and we should be fortunate for that opportunity. Um, other people go to college because they want to better their station in life, or some people go to college actually for, like, you know, the reason where they want to, like, learn all this stuff, uh, and we do encourage that. There's a lot of reasons people go to college, but I would say that one of the implicit reasons that you decided to go to college was to live the examined life, right? Because you wanted to understand your position in relation to the world, and you want to understand the world better than you did before. Yes, you did it to get a middle-class job. Yes, you did it because your parents expected you to, or your brother expected you to, or people expected you to. Uh, or maybe you did despite the fact that people didn't, they expected you not to go, whatever. Uh, an implicit reason was you wanted to understand the world. And you tacitly made the decision that the unexamined life is not worth living, just like Socrates said. Cool guy. I couldn't get the real picture. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I'm with you on that. I think that's what college is all about, is better understanding your position in, in the larger world. And you can get that in physics, and you can get that in chemistry. I think you can get that in literary criticism or literature, whatever we call it here, whatever. Uh, I think, I think you can get it in all those places, and I think you can really get it in a social psychology class, because that's essentially what the class is all about, is your position vis-a-vis -vis the social milieu, how you make and constitute the social order, and how, in turn, the other people around you shape your life and your decisions. And if you take this class, uh, hopefully you'll learn more about your position in the world. And uh, yeah, so if you're, if you're ready to do that, we'll be here Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m., and, uh, and hopefully it'll be, it'll be really interesting. So. Have a great day. See you on Thursday.